Great. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be with you today. Uh, it, it's great that uh, the civil surgeons there and, and the state of Washington are, are exhibiting such great interest uh, in this topic. I mean, you you all are the front lines in terms of, uh, you know, protecting the country with, uh, you know, those that are immigrating here uh, that may have uh, medical conditions that um, we need to be protecting the general population from. So I applaud you for doing that. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if I'm controlling this or not, and since I'm not, um, oh. what am I doing, Mohammed? You're doing good. Just let me know uh, when you want to switch to the next slide. Um, I'm not adding the slide when it's going. Okay, are we going to let you control it? This yes, is just better now. Oh Hi, Bruce. This is Kelly. So you can just go ahead and say next slide, and Mohammed will advance for you as needed. Uh, I'm not the interview. That's okay. So I'm uh, after the title page. Uh, let me just say that on slides two and three, we just have uh, typical boilerplate. Sorry, you guys are going to see this. We have a uh, typical boilerplate language, just uh, the usual, thank you, um, legal disclaimer and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm now going to slide four. And uh, just a note that if you do, uh, if you would want to reproduce or share the presentation with others, you first have to obtain permission from USCIS as shown. Next slide, please. So here's an overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, we'll start with a quick summary of U.S. immigration law, getting a, a green card or lawful permanent residence process. I want to discuss some key points about health-related grounds of so-called inadmissibility and the immigration medical exam. Then I want to address the role of civil surgeons with the form I-693 uh, uh, medical exam report. Uh, together with also the requirements for physicians to obtain designation as a civil surgeon. And then a good chunk of our discussion will review how to properly complete the form I-693. We have a couple of slides at the end of resources and several slides that are uh, addressing common questions that we get in civil surgery. Then we'll have a chance as well to have Q&A at the end. On uh, the next slide, for objectives, uh, these are the things that I hope you'll have a better understanding of after my presentation, most especially some pointers on completing uh, the I-693. Next slide, please. So, lawful permanent residence. We use the term immigrant or lawful permanent resident nationals who are allowed to live permanently in the United States. Immigrants also using the term lawful permanent resident or LPRs. Uh, and colloquially, of course, we often hear the term uh, green card holders. So I have listed here the four main avenues for foreign nationals to seek uh, lawful permanent resident status. We have close family relationship uh, through a job, a humanitarian basis, such as refugees, and a few by the green card lottery. So the, the LPR process will vary based on the qualifying category and on whether the person is applying outside or inside the United States. Next slide, please. This is just a sort of uh, a chart that illustrates the permanent residence process of people who are outside the United States doing a conscious process and people who are already in the United States with some status and are able to adjust their status. And just as a note, here in the United States, you are for U.S. civil service, uh, they're so-called panel positions, but they perform the same functions. Um, let's go to the, oh, I just wanted to point out, if you look at the very bottom column, it's very interesting that um, it's almost 50-50 of people who are uh, applying for immigrant visas and then entering as permanent residents from abroad versus those who adjust status in the United States. Next slide, please. So here's, here's where the medical exam and the uh, uh, medical health-related ground of inadmissibility comes in. Foreign nationals that come to the United States must be admissible, meaning they cannot be subject to any grounds of inadmissibility. 
So U.S. immigration laws specify certain acts, conditions, and conduct that bar foreign nationals from being admitted to the United States and from becoming U.S. permanent residents. These are called grounds of inadmissibility. There are many grounds of inadmissibility listed in the uh, Immigration and Nationality Act in what we call Section 212. Examples are criminal grounds, national security, prior immigration law violations, and the topic of this presentation, of course, health-related grounds of inadmissibility. Next slide, please. Um, specifically as to health-related grounds of inadmissibility, there are four basic medical conditions or circumstances that make a foreign national inadmissible. The first is having a communicable disease of public health significance. Another is failure to show proof of having received required vaccinations against vaccine preventable diseases. And the other two conditions are physical and mental disorders with associated harmful behavior and substance use and substance abuse disorders. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I was going to just mention that if you go to the USCIS.gov website, um, there many of you, I'm sure, have been to the so-called Civil Surgeon Portal. And if you go to that, you will see um, on the right column where we have four different um, PowerPoint presentations that were from uh, past presentations that we did. The first one in that list is a uh, sort of an overview similar to what I'm doing today, but you will also see additional PowerPoint presentations that are much more specific to um, contagious diseases, to the vaccinations, and to the uh, physical and mental uh, disorders. So you have an opportunity there to, to dig down a little bit deeper. Uh, this necessarily gives you the restrictions of time has to be a little more high level. Uh, next slide, please, or where are we at? Class A and Class B medical conditions. Um, the basis of the immigration medical examination involves diagnosing a Class A or Class B medical condition. And the applicable law, again, is Section 212A1. So the diagnosis of a Class A condition, such as tuberculosis, automatically makes the foreign national inadmissible. Uh, and note that uh, USCIS accepts the civil surgeon's diagnosis as conclusive. We are not medical experts. We have to uh, go by what the civil surgeon has uh, reported on the form. Next slide, please. A Class B condition is defined as a physical or mental condition, disease or disability, which is serious in degree or permanent in nature. And the foreign national is not inadmissible based on a Class B diagnosis. But that may impact another ground of inadmissibility, specifically whether the person might be unable to support themselves financially and so would be considered likely to become a public charge. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the medical examination is to diagnose any medical condition which would make the, applicable, the applicant inadmissible and thus not eligible for adjustment of status. And of course, the medical exam is based on the CDC's technical instructions, or TIs. Next slide, please. So role of the CDC, uh, they have several roles. They, uh, of course, are the ones who put together the uh, federal regulations uh, at 42 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 32, that define health-related conditions of inadmissibility. I just mentioned the technical instructions that prescribe the requirements for the immigration medical examination. Uh, note that there's an online citation for you. And if an applicant seeks a waiver of a health-related inadmissibility, which is allowed in certain circumstances, USCIS will consult with CDC uh, about that waiver request. And then finally, of course, CDC is available to answer questions from civil surgeons uh, based on the technical instructions. Next slide, please. Uh, I think, as we all know, a key role of health departments uh, throughout the country is that they play a, a vital role in TB control. Um, they also work especially with refugees and asylees, asylum uh, applicants. And note that the health department position, uh, a position with the health department is also able to serve as a civil surgeon uh, under what we call blanket designation, but only for purposes of providing vaccination record portion of the Form I-693. Now, they are also able to get individual designation. I'll mention that in just a moment. But by and large, most of the uh, health department civil surgeons are those that are working with the refugee population and completing just the vaccination record part. 
Next slide, please. So USCIS, our role is primarily to adjudicate the, the as it's called, the Form I-45, the Adjustment of Status application for people to become permanent residents. And then based on the results shown in the I-693, uh, we will then determine if the applicant is admissible or inadmissible on a health-related ground. Again, a Class A, inadmissible, Class B, admissible. Next slide, please. Um, further on the role of the USCIS, um, based on that determination, we will then uh, deny the adjustment of status application if the person is inadmissible. But if not inadmissible, USCIS will further adjudicate the application and approve it if the applicant is otherwise legally eligible for the immigrant category uh, that they are applying under. Uh, importantly, USCIS also adjudicates the form I-910, which is the application for physicians seeking to be designated as a civil surgeon. Now, prior to 2014, it was local USCIS offices that were doing the designation of civil surgeons within their jurisdiction. But as of March of 2014, that designation process was finalized, uh, sorry, centralized and the Form I-910 now is filed with the USCIS National Benefits Center. And just to have, so you have a current figure, we right now have over 5,500 designated civil surgeons throughout the country. Next slide, please. So this is showing you the requirements uh, for a civil surgeon designation. Uh, and they include uh, only medical doctors or doctors of uh, osteopathic medicine are eligible, provided they are licensed in their state of practice. They must not be subject to any practice restrictions. Uh, and they must have at least four years of practice uh, after residency is concluded. And of course, they must be authorized to work. Next slide, please. Uh, here's just another reference. You see a little picture of the uh, form I-910. And uh, just again to note that USCIS is able to give blanket designation to military uh, physicians to conduct a full examination. And as I said earlier, to health department physicians uh, for conducting vaccine screening. Uh, then there's no formal uh, application required in order for them to be considered blanket designated. Next slide, please. So some obligations that a civil surgeon takes on when they uh, obtain that role. Um, they have to follow the technical instructions and you're, it really, it is your responsibility to regularly check for updates. You must truthfully and accurately complete the form I-693. Uh, you are required to inform USCIS of any license restrictions, revocations, other practice uh, issues. And if you change location or other contact information, uh, the rules say that you are supposed to notify us within 15 days of that change. And you'll see here two um, email addresses that civil surgeons may use to contact us. Uh, next slide, please. This just provides, uh, this slide provides information on how civil surgeons may register to receive USCIS notices about changes in the medical exam policies Form I-693 revisions and upcoming outreach and engagement events. Next slide, please. So the main guts of the uh, talk today in uh, completion of the Form I-693. Importantly, you must use the current version of the Form I-693. And I would just mention that last October, a year ago, um, was our latest update, and that version has to be used or any uh, I-693 that a civil surgeon signs on or after January 2nd this year. And I also wanted to just alert you to the fact that a uh, new version of the form is going to be coming out soon. We have published it in the Federal Register. Uh, we expect that will be finalized uh, within the next few months, so please be on the lookout for when that occurs. Next slide, please. So both the technical instructions and the form I-693 uh, instructions require civil surgeons to make every reasonable effort to verify that the person examined and tested is in fact the person whose name is on the form I could retrieve. Applicants generally must present a valid government issued photo ID document or some other form of government recognized identity document. 
Next slide, please. All applicants applying for adjustment of status must show proof that they have received the vaccinations required for immigration purposes. Uh, some vaccines are specifically required in the Immigration Nationality Act, and others are uh, required based on determination by CDC. And here you have a link to the CDC website listing the required vaccinations. Uh, and I do want to emphasize that the date that the civil surgeon signs the Form I-693, not just the date that you conducted the exam or administered additional vaccine, it's the signature date that controls whether the vaccine is, is uh, age appropriate, whether the medical exam that you have done is appropriate to the uh, applicant's age, and also whether we're in flu season and a flu shot is required. Next slide, please. Um, something that uh, civil surgeons encounter periodically is if you need to make a referral to some other medical uh, professional. Uh, sometimes technical instructions require it, for example, in the case of an active tuberculosis patient. Uh, and also civil surgeons, uh, if the civil surgeon feels that he or she is unable to make a definitive class A, C, or B diagnosis, it needs expert assistance to resolve any uncertainty. Next slide, please. By the way, I'm going to just stop here, Kelly. Are, are you still able to hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, so it is the civil surgeon's responsibility to ensure that any consulting physician that you have uh, referred uh, verifies the applicant's identity. You must include the consulting physician's report with the Form I-693, and it is still your responsibility to um, complete and sign 693. Next slide, please. So final review, um, before signing and dating the form, you must ensure that any follow-up evaluation and treatments are concluded successfully. Make sure that you've completed all the findings and results for each part. Uh, we do have rejections that we have to send out when something is left blank. Um, you have completed part five summary of medical examination, uh, pictured below, and you have observed the applicant actually signing and dating the form. Next slide, please. And as I said just a moment ago, I want to emphasize yet again that the date that you, the civil surgeon, signed for my 693 is what controls. So I, that's something I, we can't say it enough. I get probably more questions on that particular point than any other. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the Form I-693 instructions for placing the form in a sealed envelope, but to write it on the front and back of the envelope. Next slide, please. Uh, again, you, you just have the reminder about the sealed envelope and also a reminder that the civil surgeon, uh, according to the form instructions, is supposed to give the applicant a separate photocopy of the completed form I-693. Next slide, please. There uh, are some unique variations or, or uh, unique uh, factors involving what we consider the validity of the Form I-693, and we just had a very recent change, literally a few days ago, um, that effective November 1st, the date of signature by the civil surgeon um, must be no earlier than 60 days before the applicant filed the Form I-485 Adjustment of Status application with USCIS. But when they do that, um, the form is now going to be valid for a full two years. Um, and importantly, applicants still may, while many applicants want to submit the I-693 with the adjustment application, um, they still have the option to submit the Form I-693 to us any time after the filing of the adjustment application. And in fact, oftentimes we'll do so simply in response to when they receive an interview notice from us and it says, you need to bring us the Form I-693. Uh, importantly, um, for those cases that were pending before November 1st, um, we are going to apply either the old rule on validity or the new rule, whichever would be more beneficial to the applicant. Next slide, please. This is just a, I'm not going to read through these blocks, but it's just so you have another sort of pictorial summary of what happens with the overall adjustment of status process and the medical exam. So next slide, recent developments. Um, I've included here a citation to the USCIS policy manual about the new validity rule 
and noted that a new version of the Form I-693 is in process. And something that you'll no doubt hear more about in uh, Dr. Regan's presentation, but I just noted uh, new TB requirements, uh, including the elimination of the tuberculosis skin test. By the way, on the new form that will be, that, um, you know, will be approved and finalized shortly, um, the, you'll, maybe the biggest change you'll note is that the whole, whole half a page or more of, uh, of the form that had to do with the TST is just simply gone. And the only reference is to the IGRA. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I did want to comment just very briefly on the fact that I know that the, um, there's been pretty widespread uh, media coverage of a Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General report that recently came out. It was somewhere in the middle of September, and it had recommendations on improvements to the immigration medical exam process and to the civil surgeon designation process. Uh, I've also just listed there are two primary risks uh, that the uh, report identified, and just that we are now uh, uh, exploring a variety of program improvements that would address the uh, OIG report findings and uh, help better ensure the integrity of the immigration medical examination process and the civil surgeon programs. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick reference uh, for some legal authorities governing the uh, permanent residence process. Uh, next slide some helpful general resources civil surgeons may wish to keep handy. And the next slide, uh, additional resources specific to the vaccination uh, requirements. And I'm looking at my time, Kelly. I'm going to talk about just a couple of the uh, frequently asked questions, uh, the ones that I don't mention. I'll just leave there for uh, reference. Um, we have seen some cases. Uh, I'm looking at, sorry, if you'd go to the next slide on number 40, please. Next slide. Um, there are cases that are brought to my attention where uh, a USCIS officer has erroneously asked in a request for evidence for submission of gonorrhea testing in the case of refugees. Uh, if you get one of those, you can simply respond uh, that um, the officer apparently uh, had missed the fact that this was a refugee and refugees only need vaccination records, they don't need any other parts of the medical exam. Um, let's skip down to slide 42, interpreters. Um, so what to do when the applicant doesn't speak English? Um, for purpose of the, medical, of the medical exam, this is not a formal thing. You don't have to have some court certified interpreter uh, that's there. It is perfectly fine for a family member or friend to act as an interpreter uh, for purposes of conducting the uh, immigration medical exam. Um, the next slide is on identification documents. And what I want to point out is that while, while the rules say that we want, to, want the applicant to use a government-issued photo ID, um, there are going to be cases where they just simply don't have that available. And so in those situations, we suggest that the civil surgeon include a photocopy of whatever available ID documentation that the person presented. Uh, and if there's any, you know, relevant ex related explanations, maybe make a note of that on the form. Uh, again, ultimately, it is up to USCIS uh, to determine the person's, the person's identity. And in uh, rare cases, we might send the applicant back for another exam uh, once they've obtained more definitive identification back. Um, next slide, just also, you're going to encounter more frequently, I think, instances of the name changes. So the person hands you a passport, for example, in one name, and now they say, well, I, I've gotten married, I've gotten divorced, uh, something else changed. Uh, there again, go ahead and use whatever name the applicant prefers to use, and if, it's, if the ID document is not consistent with um, the name they put on the form, then again, please... Uh, uh, make a notation of that and any explanation and copy the documents that you provided so that we just have them available to look at uh, for purposes of verifying what's happened. Um, next slide, just to mention other medical conditions. Again, uh, there was a revision in the uh, form that was last October, and the main reason for that change was to emphasize that 
civil surgeons are supposed to be completing the other medical conditions section in Part 7, Section 4, uh, and it's important to do that and not just skip over it. Um, I think at this point, the rest of the slides are self-explanatory, so I am going to stop there and uh, see if there are questions. Let me just say, um, I know typically when we do this, when I've done this presentation before, lots of hands go up and probably most of the questions are medical questions, uh, which are appropriate to address the CDC. Um, so please, if you have any questions that are appropriate for USCIS to answer, you know, issues with the form and the process and so on, those are the ones that I'd like you to ask now, please. So go ahead. Thank you so much, Bruce. I really appreciate that terrific talk. And we do have a few hands raised in the room. I'm going to start. Okay. I, I Hopefully folks have a microphone with them, so you should be able to hear directly from them. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Dr. Anderson, Mount Vernon. Uh, my question is, during the transition period uh, for TB testing and before the new forms come out, how should we handle that transition? For people who might come in for an exam the day before the new rule goes into effect and then we're submitting it and signing it uh, three days later. Yeah. Um, again, for, for, from the USCIS office, perspective, the only thing we have to go on is the date of signature by the civil service. So if, if in fact, you know, the exam was complete and before there was a change and you're just not getting around for whatever reason, um, you know, to actually sign it and dating the form, um, I, I personally think if, you know, if it was complete, everything was accurate as of the day before the change, then I don't see any issue with um, going ahead and indicating that as the, as the date of signature, given that everything was in fact final at that point in time. But if it's, if it's after, um, again, the officer is going to look at what was required on that date, and uh, you know, if there was a lag in signature and something changed and it wasn't handled, uh, it's probably going to result in a request for evidence. Hi, this is Amber Figueroa from Wenatchee, Washington. Um, <clears throat> Occasionally, I'll get a patient who has had an exam in their country of origin before coming, and then they're adjusting their status, and they've had immunizations then, but not been given a copy of that, and so then we have to start over with immunizations. Is there a way that they can, I mean, obviously at that early in the process, they don't know that they might have to do immunizations over again, but is this going to be a practice where the panel physicians will give them access to vaccines because it becomes quite expensive for them to redo yeah. things that they don't really need? Oh, yep. I mean, from our standpoint, the requirement is that that applicant has got to provide documentation to you, the civil surgeon, that you find to be reliable and trusted. And so you've got to have something to go on. Uh, as to the panel physicians overseas, I guess maybe that's more of something that the CDC um, could address as they are involved in uh, with the Department of State in the panel physician selection. And I also think that you may hear from Dr. Regan that um, I know that CDC and State Department are moving towards trying to do the panel physician examination report, State Department medical exam report, Electronically, incidentally, we at USCIS are also trying to move in that direction, but we're um, a few steps behind the Department of State in that project. Um, but that ultimately, if it's electronically available, that also might help very much as a solution to the situation you're describing. Just going to ask very quickly, Joanna, did you want to address anything later or now? It's, it's up to you. Uh, now is fine. Um, so there's actually very few um, situations in which someone should actually see both a panel physician and civil surgeon. So I'll talk about um, refugees who do that. And really, they should only be getting vaccines here in the U.S. The only other ones I can think of is K visas. And if they're, they have an option to get vaccines from the panel physician, and some do, and the panel physician should then sign complete if it's complete, and then some opt to get them here in the U.S. But typical immigrants, like a vast majority, um, 
of status adjusters as civil surgeon sees should not have seen a panel physician overseas. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Reagan. I think we've got another question right here. I have a question. The recent uh, requirement for civil surgeon report, the, um, uh, the disease status to Department of Health, uh, is this need a uh, approval from the patient? Or if the patient doesn't want to, was this um, was this this being a conflicting for the HIPAA law? I'm sorry, I'm I'm not fully understanding the question. Could you perhaps say it a different way for me? So, recent requirement for reporting the the disease status, for example, the latent TB to the ah. health. Um, if the patient doesn't want it to. Is this obligation for the service okay. agent to report, or this is? Okay. The oh, I, 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 now I understand the question. I can answer that in two ways. One, I mean, your responsibility as a civil surgeon is to follow the technical instructions. Uh, also, however, uh, on the form I six ninety three, there is no, there no, there will no longer be any uh, place to mention that. You have reported a class B, any class B tuberculosis to the health department. So, for purposes of the immigration process, it's irrelevant to us whether you have or have not um, reported the latent TB to the health department. That still could become an issue in the longer term for you as a civil surgeon, if that's something, or for whoever the civil surgeon is who may not be following the TIs, because. Uh, where that is a becomes a chronic situation, we would be looking at revoking revocation in a situation like that. We certainly look forward to addressing TBTIs as well as other TB issues on, in further talks today. I'm wondering if you can comment on the religious exemption for um, immunizations. Um, whether or not we should be making any kind of comment on the form about uh the people applying for religious exemption or just allow just check the box and then allow them to present whatever explanation they have they feel like uh, yeah, i get a lot of patients <laughs> patients that come that Sorry, maybe right. don't have a true religious exemption it's more like a philosophic exemption yeah um you know the standard for that religious exemption is fairly strenuous uh, but it, it, if the you know if you what I would suggest that you do is just explain to the applicants that if they're going to assert that exemption, you know, they're going to have to document it with us. And from, if it's your judgment from what you've heard that that doesn't sound like it's going to make them eligible to waive it, um, you know, you just want to alert them to that fact. But ultimately, um, if they're going to insist on trying to seek a waiver, um, you just indicate it's a religious objection or conscientious objection, and then we'll have to sort it out. We have a question. We're just about to. Do you have a microphone, sir? Yeah. What are the dates of a flu season? October 1st to March 31st. And Dr. Reagan, did you have something to add to that as well? I mean, really, we require a flu vaccine to be given whenever it's available here in the U.S. <laughs> uh. <laughs> So, listen to what CDC tells you, but again, for purposes of USCIS review, we're going to look at the date you signed it, and if it's October 1st to, the, to March 31st, we're going to want to be sure that the flu vaccine was administered as shown on the form. What are the dates? I, I didn't hear it. October 1st through? March 31st. So, we heard you say, Bruce, March 31st. Oh. October 1st to March 31st, but again, from CDC perspective, if the flu shot is available, we like to see people get it. More questions? Application for waiver for um, vaccination exemption. When can we sign the form? Do we have to wait till the approval? 
The applicant is going to be claiming uh, eligibility for a waiver, then they should be filling out the waiver form, uh, explaining why they're asking for the waiver, and including that when they submit the I-693 to us. So that means we can't we can't sign it yet. No, you can sign it. We sign it. It's in. their obligation. It's their obligation before they submit it that they include the waiver request and and any relevant documentation. But if that does not constrain the civil surgeon from signing off when everything is complete. Hey, thank you. Right. We've got a question here in the front row, and I think we're going to be wrapping up our questions so that we can stay on time, but in the front row. Yes. Um, how important is it that the dates of previous exams be on the I-693 form? Frequently patients have had them before, but don't necessarily have their records. And if I don't do them, I don't know when they had it before. So how is important is it to get that date on there? I think from our standpoint, it really doesn't matter because what you're doing at that point is, as I know we always like to say, it's a snapshot in time of, of the applicant's uh, you know, health condition right at that moment. So uh, whether there were previous exams to report or whatnot are ultimately really aren't relevant to what the purpose of 693 serves for us, for us here. One last question, Bruce, and then we will we will thank you and send you on uh, to the rest of your day. Please go ahead. Um, so my question is about vaccines that have a two series like MMR and varicella. So if the patient gets the first vaccine, um, do we mark it that they're current or do we wait till they get the second vaccine or can we mark it that they're no, you would sufficient time interval? Sure. Um, you can only administer the vaccine that you're able to administer, you know, at the time. And so all we need to know is that, yes, it's a, it's a series. You've given them what they needed to get at that point. It's then just going to be their obligation to follow up and get the subsequent uh, 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 administrations in the series, whatever that is. So the, 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 the series of two is not required, just the first one? Just correct? the first one, yeah. And as long as all of the... Required vaccines show that they're they're current at that point in time when you sign the form. That that's sufficient. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much for your talk today and for taking time not only to have questions within your PowerPoint that is available to all on the website, but as well as um, sticking around for Q and A today. Thank you very much, and we're.